uh, for the invitation. Well, I would thank particularly uh, John, but he ditched me, so that's right. <laughs> Anyway, so I'm very happy uh, today I get to tell you about uh, how um, constraints, positivity constraints on amplitudes uh, can be applied to gravitational theories. And from them, uh, and how from them, the weak gravity conjecture basically uh, follows as the result of uh, basic consistency conditions on a theory of quantum gravity. So first I should say that this uh, work is part of a program uh, developed with my collaborators uh, Brando Bellazzini, uh, Francesco Riva, uh, Francesco Scarlata, a PhD student that is graduating uh, this year, and now also Amanda Bandowski, to constrain effective field theories from consistency with basic physical principles. These are basically unitarity, locality, and causality. So we have found applications uh, from cosmology, where we derived a lower bound on a hypothetical mass of the graviton as a function of the cutoff of the EFT. Also to colliders, where we studied a new type of fermion compositeness uh, based on non-linearly realized uh, supersymmetries. And also higher spin theories, uh, which are phenomenologically relevant, for instance, uh, during inflation. Now let me start by telling you about uh, my motivations for doing this which is basically uh, the fact that gravity uh, is related, in one way or another, uh, to many of the deepest puzzles of fundamental physics today. For one, there is dark matter, a form of non-relativistic energy density that has been observed in many systems with different scales, but only via gravitational interactions. Next, we also have uh, inflation, a form of gravitating nearly constant vacuum energy that explains the homogeneity and flatness of the universe. Then we have the fact uh, that general, the general relativity of Einstein uh, predicts that when I scatter two gravitons to give me two other gravitons, the amplitude of this process uh, grows with the energy of the gravitons. So this is not a problem at low energies, and it's totally consistent to quantize gravity at low energies. However, uh, when one tries to extrapolate this result to energies, to very high energies of the order of the Planck mass, we get probabilities that are larger than one, which clearly doesn't make sense. So in this sense, this is the motivation uh, for UV completions of gravity, for instance, string theory. And uh, with it, also, uh, it offers a UV completion of the standard model as a whole. Now, uh, we also have the cosmological constant problem, okay? Which is nothing but the fact that uh, quantum mechanics tells us that the vacuum is not empty, so it has some energy, and therefore should wait. Now, this is related to the slide before. Since we can, in principle, pack uh, energies of order m Planck into a box whose volume is of the order 1 over m Planck cube, this means that we should expect the vacuum energy to be of order m Planck to the fourth, which is clearly a wrong prediction, since the universe doesn't double in size every 10 to the minus 34 seconds. So this prediction is wrong by 120 orders of magnitude. Finally, there is the little bit hierarchy problem, which is somewhat similar, but for the Higgs mass. The Higgs is a scalar, therefore quantum mechanics tells us that its mass should be as heavy as it can possibly be, therefore of order n Planck squared, which is again the wrong expectation uh, because if that was the case, the mass of the electron and the proton would be so large that the Bohr radius of an atom would be of the size of the Schwarzschild radius. So uh, this uh, expectation is wrong by 30 orders of magnitude. Okay, so while some of the solutions uh, of these problems might have nothing to do with gravity, that's totally fair, I think it's uh, very important to realize that to understand gravity better would be very helpful uh, to understand or explain some of these uh, puzzles. So how can we understand gravity? How can we test it? Well, we can try to test it experimentally. For instance, modifying it in the IR. And this uh, in the direction of uh, some famous, uh, the famous DGP model, which is closely related to massive gravity. However, uh, these scenarios are somewhat uh, 
weird, I would say. They are constrained both experimentally and theoretically, as I mentioned uh, in one of the slides before. So what's the size of the LDGP? Hmm? What's the size of LDGP prediction? What's the size? The size? Yeah. The lungs, LDGP. Well, it, it fixes the gravity mass, basically. It's gravity mass, roughly. Yeah. So another way to test gravity is uh, basically uh, standard one in the sense that one can hope, or one can try to probe uh, higher dimensional operators, such as this one, that contain gravity explicitly. These higher dimensional operators are added to the standard model, yes? However, this uh, line of research is uh, difficult also, because in any case, gravity couples with uh, m plank suppressed interactions. So to probe these kind of operators, it's difficult, yes? Although there might be something that we can say. If I have time, I, I will. So another uh, direction is to try to probe gravity from a theory point of view. Okay? And by this, I mean to try to understand or extract low energy predictions from its UV completion, such as a string theory. Okay? However, string theory is very complicated. Uh, it gives rise to many different uh, possible low energy effective field theories. Therefore, it's very dif difficult to extract generic predictions, okay? which is what we would like. So it's clear that uh, to make progress in this direction, uh, one would like to charter the space of effective field theories from gravity's UV completion. Okay? And this is where the concept of the landscape arises, uh, in contrast to the swampland which is where effective field theories that do not admit a UV completion in quantum gravity live. Okay. An even more general question that, I can, uh, that we can pose is uh, what is the space of consistent effective field theories, okay, regardless of uh, gravity? So effective field theory here uh, is just understood as an expansion in fields and derivatives consistent with the symmetries of the system, where generically the information about the UV physics is encoded in high dimensional operators that are suppressed by the scale, by the UV scale lab. Okay. So very well. So how can we answer these questions? Okay. Um, that boundary between swamp and landscape is very fuzzy, isn't it? Uh, probably. Yeah. I mean, at least at the present time. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So this is this is. What this it is. is really we don't know, but at the present time it's really fuzzy. Yeah, my, my point of view is that this is, uh, this is at the very first steps of what uh, could be done, maybe. I'm not sure, but it's, it's very rough at the moment, yes, thanks. So how can we answer these questions? Well, first I should tell you what it means for an effective field theory to be consistent. Okay? And this has to do with the basic uh, principles of quantum field theory, which as you know, is nothing but the unification of quantum mechanics and relativity. So what are these basic principles? Well, product of theory is unitary, meaning that uh, some probabilities uh, should be one, or the evolution of the system should be unitary. There is locality, meaning that there should be no action at a distance, and that's why we work with fields that depend on a space-time that mediate interactions. And finally, Poincaré invariance, which is basically invariance under uh, rotations, boosts, and translations which in fact define what a particle is. In particular, a particle carries a quantum number, which is a spin if it's massive, or a velocity if it's massless. Now, in quantum field theory, uh, these principles are deeply tied to other important concepts, such as causality, which means that what happens at point A cannot affect what happens at point B if the separation between A and B is space-like, or gauge invariance which I'm sure you all know, that is just the redundancy that we introduced in our description to work with local and lower and uh, covariant, Lorentz covariant fields. So this, turns out that these principles make quantum field theory very powerful, but also very constrained. So, for instance, the leading to the derivative action is fixed, and it admits particles, massless particles, up to a spin two. This uh, fact, that not everything goes in quantum field theory, uh, is uh, particularly evident or true if we combine it with the concept of effective field theory. Okay? So 
So the physics are lower than this. Uh, and to illustrate this fact, let me discuss for a second uh, one, one of the Weinberg's soft theorems, uh, in particular for the gravity. So take a given uh, amplitude from initial state i to final state j, whose uh, quantum amplitude is n0. Now deform it to uh, radiate, to emit a soft photon, a soft graviton, sorry, with momenta q. This the form amplitude can be written as this sum, okay, where pi and pj are the momenta of initial and final state particles, q as I said, the momenta of the graviton, epsilon is the polarization tensor of the graviton, and these kappas are basically the couplings of the graviton to each of the individual initial and final state particles, yes? Kept here general, and at zero momentum. We are talking about lower energies, so these couplings are at zero momentum. Now, since the graviton has only two degrees of freedom, it means that uh, when I shift uh, its polarization tensor by something that is proportional to its momentum, the amplitude should remain the same, which means that this equality should be satisfied, which has only one solution, which is that all the couplings of the graviton should be equal. So we just derived the equivalence principle. Okay. So gravity is universal. So the gravitation is nothing but the physics of a massless spin-to-field okay. that couples to the energy momentum tensor, which is conserved and unique. So we see that prime principles give us a lot of information on uh, quantum theory. Now, uh, turns out that the best object, in my opinion, to extract these kind of consequences from basic principles is the S matrix, uh, which is the time evolution operator between asymptotic uh, momentum eigenstates, and is constructed with the scattering amplitudes. Okay? In fact, uh, the S matrix is actually the object that is described by an effective field theory, given that the effective field theory parameterizes all possible scattering. So what are the properties of the ES matrix? Should be unitary, from which uh, the optical theorem follows. Should be Poincaré invariant, or rather Poincaré covariant. And now one has to note that when looking at asymptotic states, it's very difficult to tell if the interaction that gives rise to the scattering is local or causal. Okay? So that's why we turn, uh, or people turn, to the properties of the scattering amplitudes in the complex plane of kinematical values. So kinematical variables, which in the case of 2 to 2 scattering is just the usual ST. So what are these uh, properties? So basically analyticity, uh, which states that uh, the S matrix uh, cannot be more singular than poles, okay, which by uh, unitarity means particles going on shell, or branch cuts, which by unitarity means particle production. Of course, there is also crossing symmetry, which is just a statement, uh, for instance, just focusing on scalars, means that when I change initial and final state particles, the man uh, variables get reshuffled. And finally, and this is uh, important, polynomial boundness, uh, boundedness, or the so-called uh, frossard martin bond. Okay? So what does it say? It says that the amplitude in the forward limit, so for t going to zero, is bounded at large s by s log squared s. Okay. Uh, so by the way, this hat uh, from now on means uh, forward limit. So this condition, uh, that the amplitude in the forward limit is bounded, is satisfied by massive quantum field theories. Okay. And it has been shown to hold also when I scatter, for instance, open strings. Okay. So it's not something that only happens in quantum field theory, so it goes beyond this. And it's an assumption that I will be making. Okay? By the way, uh, don't be confused by the fact that I say massive, because we will also be discussing uh, massless states, but we will see how we do it for gravity. But just let me comment that for a simple scalar that is massless, one can always deform it, a little mass, a small mass, run the argument, and then send the mass to zero. Okay? So this is a total consistent deformation that it does uh, work. 
So these are my main assumptions. So the results that I will be deriving depend on these assumptions. So now is the time to ask questions. So uh, maybe that's a basic question for cluster decomposition. Yes. Why the mean analyticity? Well, cluster decomposition it's a it's a way to understand that uh, um, that when I when I separate very much these uh, two points. Sure. Yes. So I should hit uh, I should hit the singularity, which is just I'm, I'm producing the particle on shell. Okay. It's another way to. At least for me, it's another way to understand it. Yes? In the last thing you said, if you take mass C theory and send mass to zero, that's not always well defined. So that's not always well defined, indeed. That's a very good point. I can define for a scalar, I can do it even for a photon. Okay? Yeah, for scalar, I agree. But whenever you change the number of degrees of freedom. Exactly. That's a very good point. Okay? And indeed, so I will be trying to apply these conditions to gravity. Okay? So one could think, <coughs> one could think, okay, for this to hold, uh, I should give a mass to the graviton, yes, but uh, doing this changes the number of degrees of freedom, and very importantly, doing this, or these uh, degrees of freedom do not decouple, okay, so therefore it changes very much the result. Therefore, I won't be assuming that I give a mass to the graviton when trying to apply these uh, prime principles to scattering amplitudes. We will do. We will. We will see how, how we do it. Okay? Yeah. Just a, a comment about what to do if you're looking for a way around your result. <coughs> um, both the assumptions of locality and causality are a little questionable in quantum gravity. Uh -huh. Causality because. The causal structure depends on the metric, which is a dynamical field, so it's going to be state dependent. Mm -hmm. um, and locality, there are these general results that uh, general relativity has <coughs> no local observables, for instance. So, yeah, there's some. But the S matrix is, uh, should be well defined, yes? Yeah, yeah but, that, but the S matrix should be well defined. But and, and it's, it's a very good point, but yeah. I was saying I, I'm trading locality and causality by these uh, principles, right. yes? So it's it's not completely obvious that those principles should hold. It's I agree. Great but, but actually, an it's, it's not even entirely clear that the S matrix should be universally located. What's the point? Like, take S matrix in the city space. Oh yeah, it is in flat space. This is relatively asymptotic. Sure, 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 sure. we flat an ADS, let's say, or something, but if you go to the sure. background. Yeah, but that's, these are indeed very good comments, yes. Yeah. I agree. Just, I, so I, just so if I don't like your answer. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, okay, so if you wish, we go to, we move on, get okay. to the answer, and then we come back. Okay. okay? Very good. So, given these uh, principles or assumptions, if you wish, uh, one can derive a dispersion relation uh, by looking at the forward elastic to the two uh, scattering amplitude. Okay. In particular, looking at its integral, a contour integral, uh, <coughs> divided by S cube, basically. Okay. So, one can evaluate this integral in two different contours, uh, one in the IR, which encodes the IR poles and the mu, which is just a random point in, in the IR, in the complex plane. But also one can evaluate it by blowing it up, okay? So this over here. So it goes over the branch cuts and it's at infinity, okay? By the way, this piece at infinity, because of the frozen bound, I can drop, okay? This is very important. Anyway, so the rest of the details I won't discuss. This is just to show you that this uh, actually old uh, result uh, is sufficiently simple that it fits in a slide. So uh, I... Go on, go on. Mm -hmm. yes. okay, okay, simple question. Uh, I think why, we're always divided by S cubic, but why would you don't divide it by S square? 
So for this talk, I will divide by S cube. This is what I will be interested in. Yeah. Okay, One indeed. can divide by some other powers, yes. Mm -hmm. However, mm -hmm. notice that if I divide by S squared, yeah. okay, uh, this, uh, this piece over here won't vanish anymore. So I would get a contribution at infinity from the internet. Yes. Okay. Therefore, I would need more input from the UV because this okay. contour internal is UV. Sorry, can I? What is actually the setup in which you work? Because the higher dimensional operators would violate the thrust star power when you calculate, let's say, the field level scattering. Yeah, Even but. Even the Einstein gravity does violate it because it varies like a square over T. Sure. Yeah. That's so in the IR. In the IR. So yeah. the assumption of thrust star, I make it in the UV. Yeah, you or make it in beyond the, the cutoff of my FT. Yeah, so, uh, so, so is it still. You work on the assumption of some effective field theory where you exchange some infinite number of space or nothing like that? Or no, is it no, just no, adding no. higher dimensional operators? No, nothing like that, in the sense that uh, when I evaluate this, this uh, contour, it, it's in the IR. So what I end up having, most of the cases, is the forward amplitude, its second derivative with respect to S, at low energies. And this I evaluate within my EFT. Okay. Because I have, I have control, it, uh, effective field theory, I have some control, so it's a good EFT, I can evaluate it there, in the IR. So, for sure, below the curve. Okay. Now, of course, the other side is an integral of cross sections mm -hmm. up to infinite energy. Okay. And I just need to know that this quantity is positive, because it's just some uh, of our cross sections, yes? From A, B to anything. Okay. And the only assumption that I made from the UB, or the main assumption that I made is this crossal bound of polynomial boundaries. Yeah. So whatever happens beyond the cutoff of my EFT is such that amplitudes in the forward limit will drop below S log squared S. Okay. Yes. I can give you one example, um, which is a theory of interacting photons which is uh, also known as the euler heisenberg lagrange yes? It's a theory with a normal kinetic term for a photon, and the uh, leading interactions are parameterized by higher dimensional operators. Okay, these two, I'm assuming CP conservation, yes, here. With coefficients alpha 1 and alpha 2. Now, one goes ahead, computes the amplitudes for the two different combinations of polarizations of the photon in the forward limit. And they go like a number, positive number, in both cases, and it's proportional to alpha 1 or alpha 2, and they go like S squared. Okay? Therefore, when I take the second derivative, I pick alpha 1 and alpha 2, and this should be equal to cross-sections, therefore positive. So I find a positivity constraint on alpha 1 and alpha 2, which is satisfied, for instance, in a simple UV completion of this uh, Lagrangian by of uh, an electron. Okay? So I integrate an electron and I get alpha 1 and alpha 2 bigger than 0. Yes? So what I'm assuming is that the UV completion of whatever I will be discussing is such that the behavior of the amplitude at high energies in the forward <coughs> limit is the same as uh, an electron would give me. Okay? Doesn't mean that it has to be an electron, it can be whatever. Parameterize a whole class of theories as long as they satisfy this polynomial bound. What about the CP out part? <coughs> so CP out part, I don't remember now. Uh, I don't even know if it has been worked out. I guess it has. Okay. okay. Some, something similar should should go. Okay. What about the draining effect of this one? Because sure. the, the draining effect. Because R one is draining from high scale to low scale, right? The running effect. Yeah, running. Yeah, running. Sorry. Yeah. So of course these parameters are RG running. So depend on the the RG scale. So this is something that I can can easily include in my depression relation. There's no. So we're seeing about R1 larger than zero, which means R1 at any scale larger than zero, or R1 at a scale yeah, lambda no, so, larger than zero. Yeah, so this zero. is at any scale uh, larger lambda. than zero. Lambda. At scale lambda. So this is at, at scale lambda. But if I do loops, okay, these loops will be related with a branch cut that I can compute in the IR, yeah. which I know it will have to be positive. Okay. Therefore. It, 
one change the sine energy function. theory, these are multiplicative that we normalize. So you can't change the sign of them by running. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, it's particular the theory. Not running in the low energy theory. Okay. Anyway, so we are learning that UV theories with canonical as matrices, canonical as I defined them before, give rise to effectively theories satisfying positivity constraints. So the theories with wrong sine coefficients, I would just say leave in the sublet of effectively theories. Now, these kind of uh, arguments uh, have been used uh, by many uh, uh, authors uh, over the last years. Perhaps the most famous application is the proof of the A theorem. Uh, but also has been applied uh, to theories of uh, U1 Olson bosons, uh, supersymmetry uh, regarding the physics of Corstini or the R-axion, for the standard model EFT, for massive gravity, as I mentioned before, higher spins, and also quantum gravity. And I think applications keep coming. So probably I will have to uh, split this slide in two soon, but which is a proof that uh, people are interested in this uh, approach to constraint effective theories, and I think it's, it's very useful. Now, we want to do this, or, or we're doing this for gravitational theories, and there is a very important issue when we discuss gravitational interactions, which is that when I turn on gravity, there is always a t-channel change of a graviton that, as we discussed, is universal. Okay? So no matter what I scatter, I will always get a forward Coulomb singularity because the amplitude goes like inversely proportional to t. Okay? This means that uh, when I want to apply the dispersion relation, which is in the forward limit, it's basically useless. If I naively apply it, I will get infinity equal infinity, which seems okay, but totally worthless. So, uh, to apply amplitude positivity in gravitational theories, uh, I should be able to regulate the t-channel pole. Now, what's the real source of the problem? Okay? Uh, or at least this is how I see it. That in the forward limit, the soft graviton, the soft graviton probes the infinite flat space. Meaning, when I take the limit uh, t to zero, what it means is that the change momenta goes to zero. Okay? So the graviton is pro probing arbitrarily large distances. So this hints that the solution just reduced the available space where the scattering is happening. So it's not only for graviton, it's also for a photon, I know. Yeah, for Coulomb, there's a, yeah, the use of Coulomb singularities also. Yes? Okay. But for Coulomb, it doesn't grow like S squared, it just grows like S. Yeah, that is. Very good. So if uh, our intuition is correct, uh, we follow this path. Compactify your original 3 plus 1 theory in flat space to a circle okay, with uh, length L. That's the main idea. So what happens when I do this? So the graviton. Uh, the metric. By the way, notice that now I change uh, for the indices, Lorentz indices are capital letters. Okay. So the metric decomposes in a non dynamical metric, okay. meaning a metric in 3D, a metric theory in 3D doesn't propagate any degrees of freedom. And the two degrees of freedom of the 4D graviton go into the dilaton and gravipotton. Okay. And of course, there is a bunch of KT modes whose mass is inversely proportional to L. Now, a photon in 4D uh, decomposes into uh, zero modes, a photon and a scalar photon, and its KT modes. Okay. So the idea is, I take my 4D theory, I compactify it to 3D. In 3D, I impose my, disper my dispersion relation. Okay. And then, if you wish, take the limit that I decompactify against the, the circle. Yes. after I extracted my results. Okay? Because it's important to notice, I didn't say it before, I'm sorry about that, that uh, in this case, for instance, okay, if this theory is embedded in gravity, for sure, there is 
gravitational change. Yes. So what does it? What make? What sense does make that I could extract this bound? Okay. So what I did is assume that gravity has nothing to do with the UV completion of this uh, of this effective Lagrangian. Okay. So I assume that I can take first m Planck to infinity, and then take the limit, the forward limit, and extract the conclusions. Okay. Which was sensible if I have in mind that the UV completion of this Lagrangian has nothing to do with gravity. Okay. Now it's different. I want to keep m Planck uh, finite. Okay, and take the forward limit. Okay, so whatever I'm doing here, okay, I'm changing the theory in the IR. It has to regulate this IR singularity. Now, several important comments about the scattering in 3D. Uh, first, about the little group in 3D. Uh, so, for massless particles, the little group is just a Z2. So, there are two types of states of massless states. There are basically scalars which are the ones that uh, are odd under the Z2, and there are fermions, which are the ones that are even. So all the states in the previous slide okay, are basically scalars, simple scalars. And this one can show explicitly because one can do a duality transformation of a vector in 3D to a scalar. Sure, now, question. Yeah. this may be included in what you're calling the dilaton there, but the metric still should have one degree of freedom. It should have a modulus, the, the radius of the cylinder. Yeah, that's the dilaton. Okay. Yeah, thanks. Okay. Now, uh, what else? So as I was saying before, we are keeping gravitational interactions. We are not sending M Planck to infinity. And this is clear because these guys, the dilaton and the gravity photon, still mediate interactions. Okay, very good. <coughs> now, what is also important is that even though there are no propagating degrees of freedom in the metric, in 3D, there is still non-trivial gravitational scattering. Okay. And this is a sort of a of bone like scattering, because whenever I put a source of energy momentum in my 3D space, it changes it, it creates a singularity in space. So, the space is everywhere flat, except at the singularity. And this uh, is a problem that has been worked out by uh, many authors uh, around the 90s, with the end result that the leading gravitational amplitude is this one over here. Okay. By the way, there's another way to understand this scattering, uh, which is that when I add a source uh, in my space, it changes it, it creates a, a deficit angle, which is another way to say that the scattering happens in a conical space. Okay? Which, uh, funny thing, uh, propagation of waves in uh, such a space has been discussed already in the 19th century by some of them. Anyway, so let us discuss this amplitude, which will be central. Now, if I decompactify first, okay, so I send L to infinity, uh, this piece will vanish, okay, and I will recover the fourth result S squared over T. Okay. One for the vowel L? So this one over L in front is basically normalization of the states. I'm scattering here to these states, <laughs> not for these states. Okay. All my scattering amplitudes will go like one over L. However, I don't want to do this, and this is crucial. I want to first take the limit t to zero, so the forward limit, and then, if I wish, I can just uh, decompactify. So when I do this, this amplitude goes to a constant, which is irrelevant for my dispersion relation, because my dispersion relation uh, is, involves the second derivative of the amplitude with respect to s. Okay? So in this sense, in 3D, Gravitational scattering, I would say, is more under control than in 4D. It's simpler. And I can take the forward limit. Is, uh, is this combined, uh, this uh, extra space to a circle L, is the only possibility for them? Can you compare to other space? I could come up with, uh, well, it would be interesting to come up with other 
types of regulations of the power singularity. This is what you have in mind. Okay. Sure. Uh, for instance, one could try to go to 2D instead of uh, 3D, so one dimension less. The important point is that I don't miss in the information that I'm interested in. Okay. And I will show you that at least doing compactifying to 3D, I don't. Is it obvious that taking the limit T goes to zero and then taking to the derivatives it commutes with taking two derivatives and then taking t goes to zero? No, it's not, it's not trivial. It's not trivial. It, I mean, it looks to me as if if you took your two derivatives with the amplitude and then took that limit and then took L to yeah, uh, that's also, you might have something. Yeah, that's also, I think that's also a limit that don't, don't commute. Limits that don't commute, yes. Okay. So why is yours the right one? Why do you, if, what? if what comes in in the dispersion relation is the second derivative, what I, uh, why is it right to take the forward limit before you take the second derivative instead of after? Well, as you, the dispersion relation is obtained by considering the forward amplitude in the complex S plane, yes? Uh -huh. So I already start with the forward amplitude. That the, the, the I pick the second derivative is just the fact that I subtract by s cube. If I subtract by s to the fourth, it would be the fourth derivative. I mean, it's a okay. result. Okay. It comes after, yes? Okay. Okay. The, the forward limit is important because I can relate uh, s channel singularities with u channel singularities. Okay. Mm -hmm. So the other way around wouldn't, wouldn't work. Very good. So let me tell you why this is important. And one of the important applications that we found is the weak gravity conjecture. Okay, so what time is it? 10. 10, 20 minutes, more or less. Okay. So the mild form of the weak gravity conjecture uh, is a statement about the extremal black holes being able to decay. Okay. So what is a extremal black hole? Uh, is one that has maximal charge under a U1 gauge field, okay, for a given mass, which in suitable units this one over here is just m equal q, defines an extremal black hole. For this extremal black hole to decay, just by energy and charge conservation, there should be a state in the, uh, within, within, within the decay products which has a charge that is larger than its mass. Okay. And this ratio is bigger than one. Okay. So there is something very interesting, or potentially very interesting, here, because uh, if one takes for granted that black holes, stable black holes, should decay, this is a completely different story. So let me, let me take it as it is. Uh, it seems that I'm predicting a state with particular properties. So it seems that this is a statement that goes beyond the effective field theory. Okay? It's very interesting. Um, However, uh, what happens if we consider this uh, Einstein-Maxwell theory, so general relativity plus U1, as the effective field theory that we expect it to be? And uh, this question was already realized in the original paper, or its importance, because basically what this condition is telling me of extremality is that uh, gravity is as strong or as weak as the U1. So when I compare the interaction between two identical extremal black holes, they stay uh, static in the sense that the force is actually cancelled. Therefore, this means that higher dimensional operators will dip the balance. Okay? We make the black holes now track more. Very good. So, so these are the higher dimensional operators, the leading ones. You can find here the same ones as before for the Euler-Heisenberg. <coughs> now I normalize them with M Planck, but this is just a convention. So you basically also assume CP. Also uh, here I assume CP. What if there is a violation or um, Again, I don't remember. Okay. I don't. So there is one more operator if uh, there is gravity involved, which is the light tensor. Sorry, this combination of uh, F squared and pi. Now, um, 
these high dimensional operators shift the extremality condition of a black hole, okay? which now reads 1 plus a correction that is, of course, proportional to a combination of these high dimensional operators, in particular here, 2 alpha 1 minus alpha 3. So it turns out that if this combination of coefficients was positive, the, si the same extremal black holes are the ones suggested or predicted by the weak gravity conjecture because they have a charge to mass ratio larger than one. Meaning, large extremal black holes, the ones very large, can decay to the smaller ones. Okay? So in this sense, automatically, extremal black holes can decay. Again, this is only possible for this combination of coefficients being positive. So it's clear that now amplitude's positivity would be important if we could show that this is indeed positive. So the idea is, take this theory, compactify it to 3D, draw these present relations there, and accept the result. Uh, so this effective operator is coming from, what's the UV scale of this effective operator? It's on a scale lambda, which is encoded in the size of alpha 1 and alpha 2. Again, the only assumption that I'm making on this physics, or the main assumption that I'm making on this physics in the UV, is that it satisfies polynomial boundaries. Okay. That, that very high energies pass the cutoff, the amplitudes are bounded by S log squared S. Okay. Okay. And this is the result when I go and scatter the photon uh, 3D zero modes. <coughs> so when I scatter the scalar modes, I get precisely 2 alpha 1 minus alpha 3. Okay. Which uh, by my dispersion relation should be larger than 0. In this way, uh, we offer a proof of the weak gravity conjecture, the mild form of it, at least, from prime principles of the S matrix. Okay. Now, let me add some comments on these results. First, about loop corrections. Because when I compactify, I get all these KK modes okay, that I can just produce, they enter my amplitudes. Okay? And it turns out that they do enter amplitudes such as a scalar uh, elastic scattering, but they enter in a particular way. So in fact, one can see that the sum of our KK modes uh, goes like 1 over n, and when I sum, uh, it approaches a log. Okay? This log, turns out, is just the IR running okay, of the high dimensional operators by gravity which we can show it has a negative beta function because as I was saying it's related to, it, it's related to a cross section of KK production which we know it's sign, it's positive mm -hmm. okay. and this is in fact confirmed well, it was realized already long ago in the 70s that in Einstein-Maxwell with high dimensional operators the running associated with gravity uh, has a negative beta function Meaning, these coefficients in the IR grow positive. Which, by the way, is telling us that the weak gravity conjecture, the mind form, is automatically satisfied for very, very large black holes. Okay? Because whatever I have in the UV, positive or negative, it will eventually be compensated by the running. Therefore, they will turn positive at some point. Okay? What we have shown if you wish, is that since we have control about, about these loops, we can subtract them. Okay? So we just subtract them from the dispersion relation, and we're in fact therefore sensitive to alphas evaluated close to the color. Okay? Use the procedure of subtracting in dispersion relations. Yes. Now what about the other positivity bounds that we got? Well, it turns out that this combination of coefficients being positive means that the extremity condition for magnetic extremely black holes goes in the right direction for them to decay. And this is something that was studied uh, shortly after our work, uh, for instance, in this paper or this paper. Okay. This one over here concerns dionic extremely black holes, in particular the ones that have equal electric and magnetic charges. Yes? So same kind of result. One can generalize this, 
So we we did generalize this to particular linear combinations of the polarizations of the photon. Why would this even be surprising? Here is what what I mean by that. I mean, in some sense, actually, the at least classical way that has S duality. So if you introduce monopoles to complete that S duality by mm -hmm. enforcing it also on those box space states. Mm -hmm. Then, in principle, if you impose your your electric uh, gravity convection, maybe maybe this is just the the magnetic. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <coughs> or dionic, dionic would be in dionic would then be just an example of taking a discrete as duality e into b, b into minus e into a uh, rotation in the e b space. And so I, I would I would agree with that uh -huh. if I would find the same combination of coefficients, but I don't because this guy changes sign. So it could have been... Well, the sign, you know, E goes into minus B, and yeah, goes exactly, into exactly. E, so, so that happened. could be that change. Sure. I don't know. Sure, no, 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 it's exactly that. So maybe it's a non-trivial track, actually. <coughs> I'm not exactly sure that, that the vial couple... Yeah, I, well, yeah, well yeah. very good. <laughs> so there is the vial couple. Well, it's the one that is not invariant because there is this minus sign, yes? Yeah. On the duality transformations. It picks a minus. Right. Okay, that makes sense. If, if you just... Yeah. In fact, it's a way to show, it's a very interesting comment, that here I only mentioned running of alpha 1 and alpha 2. Why? Basically, dual invariance. Okay? Because if I start with Einstein Maxwell without higher dimensional operators, I know that the two terms that I have respect duality, therefore they cannot generate something that violates it. Yes. Alpha 3 is not normalized. So by, uh, by considering uh, arbitrary linear polarizations of these photons, uh, we derive this uh, continuous set of positivity bounds, which it turns out, uh, if I'm not mistaken, uh, checking, is a bound that was derived, again, also after our work, from a different type of condition on quantum gravity, which is that the, um, the change in entropy of a black hole when I add high dimensional operators is positive which is something that has been claimed by uh, these authors, uh, Chung and Remen, as another, as the main assumption behind another proof of the weak gravity conjecture. So at least there's, there's some agreement there. Now, one can now uh, speculate beyond DFT, saying if I'm finding that the curve of extremal black holes lies here, so below extremality condition Q equal M. This is what positive coefficients, positive 2 alpha 1 minus alpha 3 is telling me. Perhaps uh, I can surpass the regime of my EFT. Okay, so in my EFT, I can only consider black holes that are heavier than M Planck squared over lambda, lambda being the color of my EFT. But perhaps there is, so, there is some rationale that al allows me to pass this threshold and go to Sub, uh, sub planckian states, what I would call uh, particles, yes? Uh, I don't think this is uh, general. Um, well, it hasn't been proved for sure that it's general. Some cases it has been shown that it, did, that it follows from modular invariance and in string theory, but uh, I mean, it's, a, it's an interesting direction to, to, to pursue. Now, uh, the main, finally, the last comment is the main UBE assumption, as I said before many times, is uh, the force are bound. So what happens if we depart from it? Okay. So what happens in the, is if this limit is different from zero? I want to depart from it in a particular way, in a way such that when I decouple gravity completely, I recover the usual standard force are bound. And this is the maximum departure that I can have. Okay? This is actually suggested uh, by the fact uh, that we computed amplitudes in 3D of gravitational st states, for instance, the dilaton. And we find that two different amplitudes depend on alpha 3 with different sizes. So what one would conclude if the frosser bound is exact, that alpha 3 should be 0 which we know it doesn't have any reason to be. So this departure allow, allows alpha 3 to be as big as m Planck squared over lambda squared. 
which uh, is in fact a result that was obtained in 2014 uh, by Madison and collaborators following other different methods. Okay? Sorry, I'm sorry, I'm not understanding your point here. Um, I don't know what to say now. <laughs> how did you get your, can you just say again how you get this bound on alpha 3? So, What's the logic? I just, I just not understand the logic. Yes, let me first keep the same assumptions as before. Frost art is satisfied, okay? Meaning amplitudes at high energies in the forward limit are bounded by S, mm -hmm. log squared S. It would mean that these amplitudes, these two amplitudes, should be larger than zero, okay? However, this one depends as plus alpha 3, while this one depends as minus alpha 3. Therefore, I would have to conclude that alpha 3 is zero. So I know standard UV completion, a loop of a particle that is charged, will contribute to alpha 3. So it cannot be zero. Therefore, we consider the main to deviate from the main assumption, okay, which is deviating from frost bound. So I'm saying there is a contribution at infinity when I do my dispersion relation, okay, that remains, but that goes like 1 over lambda squared, the cutoff, and then Planck squared such that when m Planck squared goes to infinity, I decouple gravity, I should recover the standard force of bound. So by comparing these two. Okay, so, so can I, maybe this is a point, I, uh, this is something I wanted to ask. This, this may be rather naive, but in, in four dimensions, I would think that in a theory of gravity, if you look at two to two scattering, uh, it's believed, at least, I think, that it very, very high energies, super Planckian energies. In fact, that goes to zero even, goes to zero very, very rapidly, right? Because the picture is <coughs> that you form black holes and they decay to many, many objects, right? Yeah. It's like a supercharged version of the fact that like pi on pi on, two pi on to two pi on scattering above lambda QCD goes to zero really fast, uh -huh. except this is probably even faster than that. Yeah. So in other words, you've got something much, if you believe that, you have something much, much stronger than Bossard bound. But that's, that's in four dimensions now, right? So yeah, my yeah, question is, in three dimensions, what do we believe? I mean, do you make, maybe this, do we make black holes? Do we have this kind of picture? So, I yes. don't know what the picture is in 3D. So, so let me comment. It's a, it's a very good comment, but first, this behavior uh, in 4D is for a change momenta different from zero, that you create black holes and then at, at, uh, when the change momenta goes to zero, moment. there are no creation of black holes. Right, because this is the T goes, to, right, this is the forward limit, I'm sorry. So that's yeah. correct, right. Okay, so. Now, yeah. second comment, in 3D there are no black holes, at least in flat space. Right. And if I am, don't add a topological mass for the gradient. Yeah. Uh, does, it, does it it means just you show that uh, in this 3D space, uh, your uh, throttle bound is not satisfied. It's not that satisfied, okay. okay. Cannot be satisfied. It cannot be satisfied by gravitation when I scatter gravitational states, mm -hmm. okay. okay. And I get this bound, which is the same one that was obtained uh, like uh, some years ago. Now, if I demand that the steel, when I scatter non gravitational states, mm -hmm. Frost at holes, okay, meaning that these two should still hold, okay, it poses an up, a lower bound on the size of alpha 1. Okay. Now I can do just a simple estimate of what alpha 1 and alpha 2 and alpha 3 would be when I loop a particle that is charged, define the charge to be just 1, which is the definition of the pH coupling if you wish. I'm getting that for normal frost, for normal scattering of non-gravitational states, to be positive, I get that the cutoff, the mass of this particle that I'm looping, should be below g times m plus. But what, what is? Why should I think that there's some meaningful distinction between gravitational and non-gravitational states? I mean, well, once they, the they, plus they, arc they, doesn't work anymore in three D. Why should it work for some states, not for others? Well, so, would you? I, I think we all agree that gravitational interactions are, there's indi there are indications that gravitational interactions are fundamentally different than non-gravitational ones. No? Uh, 
uh, I don't know, but well, it, gravity. I don't know. Gravity's uh, everything feels gravity. So why should some states obey this bound and some not? I don't. I mean, is that that's your argument? Is just maybe they do because gravity is different? I mean, yeah. Well, the onus, so, of proof, the onus of proof is to show that the Poussard bound does hold, right? Once you've got the yeah, example where exactly. it doesn't hold, the onus <coughs> of proof is to show that it yeah. does hold, right? So, so let me turn it around. I'm telling you what the conditions, minimum, the the basic condition on scattering amplitudes are for the weak gravity conjecture to be satisfied. So I'm telling you about something about quantum gravity. Okay. Which is this assumption. Now this being said, as I mentioned, it has been checked that when I scatter open strings, so we have a UV completion of gravity. We think we do have a UV completion of gravity. When I scatter open strings, the behavior is the correct one, meaning process bound. When I scatter closed strings, which are supposed to be describing gravitational states, turns out process bound is not satisfied. When I scatter closed strings in a string theory. And this is why, motivated by this fact, by an explicit example, I'm, make, I'm, I'm, I'm discussing, I'm making this discussion, yes. You mean, you mean in the four dimension, gravity scattering does not satisfy further bound? When I scatter closed strings, no. It grow, it grow, it's still bounded, okay, a large S in the forward limit, but mm -hmm. not by S, bounded by S squared. In yeah, any dimension of gravity? Or? Well, of course, so strings mm -hmm. live in many dimensions, yes, but the, the fact that in theory, one, one, one basically resounds at very high energies, it goes, it's bounded by S squared, not S. Okay. In the case, in the cases where I can compute such a scatter. So what is this type two string theory in the of something like that? I, I think Probably so. Some other are short, but the model. Yeah. Type one, I think, is just all two strings. Yeah. I okay. think so. So, at the beginning, you associated the Fossard bound with uh, causality and locality. Yes. Has anybody traced this argument backwards to say what this violation says about locality and causality? No. Uh, well, in fact, yes. In fact, somehow. So, a paper by Adams uh, et al. Uh, I all mean Neymar Kernismanet and Ricardo Rotazzi were there. Nicolis, someone else. Okay, someone Who else. Works? Huh? Who works? Marlo. Ah, yeah. Or Dubov, no, Dubovsky. Dubovsky. Dubovsky were there. Pretty anyway, so yeah. they uh, traced uh, this behavior of the amplitudes to uh, a causality in the IR when I consider this theory in non-trivial backgrounds. Okay, so let me just discuss. So this theory with photons, yes. Okay, so they show that if I put this theory in a non-trivial uh, electromagnetic background, if alpha one and alpha two have the wrong sign, I can get superluminal photons, superluminal photons, which are not necessarily bad. Okay, it doesn't, this doesn't mean that there is violation of causality, but they also found that in certain backgrounds, uh, one can get closed time uh, surfaces, which this is indeed bad. Yes. So this is the this is the connection that people have done between wrong sign coefficients, which are connected with Frosart. Okay. And locality in Kozari, okay. as far as I know. But nobody's directly worked from Kozari to locality? I, not that I know. Okay. But that, that would be really interesting. But I think that just of EFC, like low energy QCD, all these amplitudes violate for us are bound badly with the, with the high dimensional operators. But I don't know how to conclude from that. The higher dimensional operator, if I look in the EFT, for sure, but yeah. when I start seeing the high energy behavior is when I cannot compute anything. So the statement is, when I go past the cutoff right. of QCD, I know that I have, for yeah, instance, quarks. Yeah, but you quarks. can't use it anymore, right? So, so 
maybe you just can answer that question <coughs> because you, you are in IR, you have a theory in IR, yeah. violates cross R bound. Yeah, but yeah. first it's about the behavior of the amplitude right, of large but, S. Yeah, indeed. So, so you sit on some pole, you go to large S, but your theory is not supposed to work there any, anyway. My EFT, no. no. That's why it's an assumption about the UV physics. Right, but it should yeah, still but be something that whatever the correct UV theory is, that that right. violates. Yeah, no, I'm not sure because for this low energy QCD, you can measure these coupling, right? Yeah. So you just measure them, you put it in the result, and your IR amplitude violates that. Yeah. Uh, of course, it's not a complete result, so. Yeah, yeah. Some yeah. Yeah. Just wants to assume that it's a property of the complete theory. Yes. So that's an assumption, but given that assumption, the rest follows. No, yeah, I'm just saying that uh, we are not able to calculate things to non perturbatively or to all loop order, but if you just look at some tree level contribution or one loop, it would violate it. And from that, you cannot say that the theory is not local. Maybe the complete theory is local. Yeah. I, I don't know. Yeah. This is, uh, yeah, and my assumption is in some sense about the complete theory beyond the cutoff. When I resolve, when I resolve quarks and gluons, yes. <coughs> I mean, if, if another way to say it, if you took his contour to be the radius to be small enough so it was valid inside the effective theory, then your comment would apply, and then you would conclude nothing because you couldn't conclude any positivity. Yeah. But that's okay. Yeah. No contradiction. But. If you allow him to take the contour all the way to infinity, and you assume that's the assumption that we're discussing, right? The plus R bound works there. Then you you get the conclusion. That's basically it. But yes. Okay, so there is not much uh, time. Uh, let me just comment that, of course, now these type of uh, dispersion relation can be applied to modify gravity, not also to the weak gravity conjecture. Uh, so one simple example, let me consider a P of X theory, X being the derivative of a scalar field squared. Okay. Without gravity, I could conclude that this coefficient of this uh, fourth order derivative is larger than zero. Now with gravity, I cannot do it. And in fact, these kind of theories are interesting in the cosmological constant. When the decay constant is of order M Planck H, H is Hubble. Okay. Uh, which is precisely the regime where the forward limit is sensitive to. Okay. And now we've shown that we can cure this, okay, we can address it, and indeed derive that the, this coefficient a should be larger than zero. Uh, the same goes for similarly for other types of modified gravity theories. Let me skip it and uh, discuss a bit about the outlook. Uh, so. The weak gravity condition has many versions that it would be worth uh, looking into as checks or perhaps as a way to learn something more about positivity constraints on IR theories. Yes. Is, uh, one is a multiple U ones. A particularly interesting one it would be if there is supersymmetry. Because if there is enough supersymmetry, the leading corrections, or there are no corrections to the extremality bound of uh, black holes. Therefore, there must be something going on in the scattering amplitudes that I cannot, I should not be able to derive the constraint that uh, this coefficient should be larger than zero. Okay. So this is something that we want to check. Um, so there are other interesting gravitational theories that one could apply the constraints. Uh, now let me mention uh, two interesting uh, things that I find at least that I find interesting. So one is uh, we constructed recently uh, what we call the GR's MEFT, which is basically the EFT, the more general EFT for the standard model, including gravity. Okay, the trick is basically using this Hilbert series uh, and use as a building block of the EFT the bile tensor. So you can recognize here operators like these two, which are very similar to the ones of the weak gravity conjecture. But there are some others that are, for instance, this Higgs squared, pi squared. Very little discussed about these type of operators in the literature. So I believe one could still learn 
via dispersion relations about these coefficients. So perhaps learn about the connection between the standard model and the UV completion of gravity from a theory point of view. And finally, um, these authors, Graham and Tolly, after our work, uh, uh, showed that when one considers the propagation of gravitational waves in non-trivial gravitational backgrounds, particular FLR, W, and warp geometries, the coefficients, the sign of the coefficients that we derived on high dimensional operators imply that uh, gravitons always uh, move faster than photons. Okay? So if one takes this result, which is limited, okay? particularly they only look at this type of operators, r squared or by squared, which by field definitions are connected to f squared and f to the <coughs> If they have the signs that we said uh, they have, turns out that gravity is the fastest force. Okay. Is there something there beyond these simple cases? I don't know. Maybe. Uh, I think it's interesting. Yeah, that says that's, that's saying that the <coughs> field can travel outside the physical space time light cones. Yeah, but it depends it depends on which light cone. And they make yeah. they, they, they point that out explicitly. It had been pointed out before. So probably that, that what happens probably is the ratio of velocities. Because I can always do a field definition of the metric that changes the light cone. The point is that for so that matter travels subluminal with respect to the light cone of uh, gravity, yeah. set by the gravity, yes. But the gravity light cone is the light cone along which perturbations of the causal structure yeah. propagate. So this is saying that if you change the causal structure a little bit, matter is not going to be able to move outside of your new causal yes. structure. Exactly. So that's some sort of stability of causality. Yes, yeah. I, I agree. That's really nice. <coughs> fact, I mean, it seems like you could try to turn that sort of argument around. It seems almost more convincing than the... Uh, than the uh, Black holes behind the decay. Well, the, no, the process are the process are yeah. around of these. Exactly. Right. Well, so yes, exactly. So these might be more physical, more IR dominated reasoning. Okay. But as a, so this is interesting to follow because they only looked at some particular geometries, only these operators. Yeah. So, anyway, so let me conclude. Um, but since it's late and there has been many questions, let me. For you to read. Okay. Thanks. Thanks. Okay. Can, can I take you back to your slides on this modified gravity? I don't have a specific. I just want to understand this, this one. Or yeah, this one. Yeah. So what, what are you saying here? That without gravity, you can take A to be anything, including positive. Without negative. If right? I forgot about gravity, I would. Uh, conclude via dispersion relation that this coefficient has to be sure, positive. Sure, sure, sure. Okay? Good. And now, then you say, okay, let's consider cosmology. In cosmological settings, yes. the size of uh, this decay constant is of this size. Therefore, first we ask, can we forget about gravity in these scenarios? Since this seems to be below a plank. Well, no. Because when I do the scattering, okay. there is a higher cutoff. Your point is that the scaling with F squared. <coughs> yeah, exactly. So one couldn't conclude anything in these type of setups about A. So you don't want to change the sign of the amplitude, so this has to be something. Yeah, in general. But now we can do it. That's the thing. These values of F, we can conclude A larger than zero. By the way, notice that here I'm considering a space that is not uh, flat. This requires some It's funny because I can start with the fourth theory that is not flat, and when I compactify it, make it flat. Okay? Changing the if I add neutrinos or if neutrinos are there and I can change the mass of the neutrinos, can I can make the vacuum energy in 3D to be just zero. And I can draw my arguments. Something. Anyway. Any more questions? Okay,
Thank you. Yeah. for some more discussion. That's not to be Yeah, the fact, yeah, I think you reminded me, you know, I, I think, I, I, I mean, I've always, there, there's this thing that, uh, even though you were, you kindly cited, you know, our, our work on the A theorem, it's always bugged me and Ricardo, we're the only two people on earth who seem to be bothered by this proof. Um,